folks moved to, to Maine from Minnesota. And so we, I wasn't around my family growing up. Every once in a while, we'd go back out and meet my cousins. My mom came from a family, I think it was 12. Uh, so I got cousins all over the place, but I never really got to know them or, and see them much. And then, of course, graduating from Bible school and coming back up uh, to Maine, my family's always been far away. And so church has really been my family. You know, I married into a, uh, into a family, and actually uh, they've opened up their arms to me and make me, make me feel like one of their own. And I'm thankful for that. My father-in-law, uh, we got ourselves in more trouble when he was alive than we probably should have. Uh, but it was great working together, uh, taking care of projects together. But overall, most of our, my adult life, church has been my family. And uh, I don't think you guys realize how much you mean to me. Uh, because my family has been far along. And to be welcomed in uh, just means a lot. You know, and this, is, this has been a, a church that's very welcoming. I, I think of, hopefully, you know, we have people who haven't been here all that long. Hopefully you feel welcome. The people here are warm and, and generous and consider you part of the group. And so we looked at Rahab, right, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we looked at Ruth last week. Uh, today we're going to look at Bathsheba and how she's been brought into uh, the lineage of Christ, and, and she's a, a, a person we don't have a whole lot about. I mean, Ruth, we have a whole book about Ruth. Um, Rahab, we have a pretty uh, good explanations of how she was involved. Bathsheba is one of these ones that we don't really hear whole much from, but we hear a little bit about. And this morning I want to take a look here in the book of 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11. As we recount the account of who Bathsheba was. Um, chapter 11, verse 1, it starts off as, as it happened in the spring of the year, at the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab, his servant with him, and all Israel, and destroyed the people of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, it's the spring of the year after the planting. You've got to realize how, uh, you know, Crops and all that was very important. Most of these places didn't have a full-time military. So what would happen is you'd have a, the Bible talks about this time of war. And so what happened is you would stick around in the spring, plant all your crops, right? Then after that was all set up, then you would go to war. And then at the, in the fall, you turn around and say, okay, time out, because it was time for harvest, and everyone had to go back to and harvest their things. And so over the, the period of, of summer, this would take place. And it was time for battle, time for war. David was a man of war, uh, a skilled warrior who had become king. And now he is brought in, and he stays behind. David should have been out in the battle, but he stayed behind. Verse 2, it says, Then it happened in the evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the son of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now Uriah is one of the soldiers that was with David for a long time, even when David was not king. Uriah was one of his right-hand men. And it's hot, and, and David can't sleep, and so he goes out on his roof, out, out and overlooks, and there is Bathsheba, who is out there bathing. Now, you need to realize in, in the Middle East, oftentimes the top of your house became an extra floor. Now, it was in the evening, so I, I presume that Bathsheba was pretty innocent in this. I think she just saw, it's hot, I, I, I got the water, right, we're up on the top. Uh, most of them have some kind of, of shading, uh, lattice work that provided some kind of protection. So I believe that she thought that she was uh, safe up there. And so she's taking her bath out there. Now David, being the king, the palace, if you look at Jerusalem, it all kind of goes uphill. So David's the palace would have been up higher than everyone else. And so as David goes out, he is able to look over everything, and he sees her there. 
So David should have been out in the battle, but he was not. He stayed home. If David had any self-respect, he should have came out and as soon as he saw her, turned around and looked the other way. But David did none of those things. David stayed behind. And then now we have David lingering and seeing her. I love it. We're going through this with uh, the kids in CEF. We were at the school. And, and we're, you know, when you talk about this, you got to be kind of careful talking to the little children. And so that he saw her bathing. And he looked at her and saw she was pretty. And I just left it at that. And probably about five minutes later, talking about more of the story, uh, this little boy raises his hand. He goes, he saw her naked? It's like, yeah, he did. And he goes, that's wrong. I said, you know, even a little boy realized David was in the wrong in this. As we pull out this thing, we see about Bathsheba. Bathsheba was really in a situation where she was Helpless. Right? The king looks out and inquires of her. So the king is in a spot where he sees her and he should have known better. I've read a lot of different commentaries and some of them want to shift the blame to Bathsheba. I don't see that in scripture. And nowhere do I see the scripture blaming her for this. And sometimes our society wants to blame the victim. Especially if someone is, has power or someone has authority. We see this in our politics all the time. Right? I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Libertarian. Right? There are wicked men and wicked women on all sides of the aisle. Can you agree with that? And we turn a blind eye oftentimes at the wrong that they do because of who they are. And we turn sometimes against the victims. Now, don't get me wrong. We live in a society where we sort of elevate victims and sometimes, you know, people like to play the victim when they're not. But in this case, Scripture is clear in all this that David is in the wrong. David is in the position of authority. David has all the power. Bathsheba has none of this. She is just a, a, a wife of one of his soldiers. And I can't help to think that sometimes in our lives that we are find ourselves helpless. Right? Sometimes we're helpless because of our circumstances. Right? None of us can control what family we came into. Right? Some of us have no control over uh, our job of we lose it or not. I remember when we first moved to Maine. And uh, I was looking for, for work and ended up working for a carpenter. And we're coming up this time of year. And if you work in carpentry, you know this time of year things often get a little lean. And so we were always asking, hey, do we have enough work? He goes, oh yeah, no problem. He goes, I have enough work to keep you all employed until March. So we're like, oh great. So came Christmas and I told my wife, look, he's got work. Um, so we'll go out and we'll buy gifts. So we bought gifts and presents based on knowing that we were going to have work. It was about four days before Christmas. He walked around the work site, handing each of us, one of us a pink slip. And we we're like, whoa, 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 what's, what's this? He goes, I don't have enough work. I was like, why didn't you tell us, right? Because we probably spent more money. You know how it is, right? Christmas time, you, you tend to spend a little more money than you actually have. Well, maybe that's just us. And so if we had known, right, that work was going to dry up, we probably wouldn't have bought as much. We would, you know, we'd probably be much more careful. But thinking that we were going through, we asked him, hey, wait a minute, how come you didn't tell us? And he's like, well, I was afraid all of you would quit before the job was done. He goes, well, I had to lie to you to keep you on the job site so I can fire you right before Christmas. I was not feeling too confident coming home and saying, Hey, honey, Merry Christmas. I got a pink slip. 
But those were circumstances I had no control over. Oftentimes, life happens to us. Right? You know how that goes. Right? The car breaks down. The furnace goes. <sighs> what a great time for all of this. I think I shared with you before, I, I worked with a man, and, and he was reading this book. And he showed up at the work, place, a different workplace, and, and he showed up and he was like, look, I've decided I, I'm no longer going to be a victim of life, I'm going to happen to life. I was like, okay. So I talked to him about three days later, I said, how's that going for you? He goes, he went home and the hot water heater had broke. Uh, the child ran across the counter, broke the faucet. And he went on, he, he goes, so how's this you happening to life going? He goes, this is not going too good. Because we can't control the circumstances. Right? We look at Bathsheba. Right? She had no control over David. She didn't make him stay from the battlefield. She didn't make him walk out on that roof. He didn't make her stay there. Right? Uh, she couldn't make him not inquire. Right? All these things she had no control of. She was a victim. We see throughout this passage that, look, she's a victim of the circumstances around her. And maybe you have found yourself victim of circumstances that you have no control over. And sometimes we're helpless because we're powerless. Right? Sometimes we just can't. There are things that happen that are beyond our ability. And I find out more and more, the less control I have on things. Right? Now, maybe you have figured out the secret. Please share it with me. It's interesting, there was a study done several years ago, and it talked about uh, those who worked in corporate America, and talked about people who, who die of heart attacks because of stress. And it was an interesting study because they talk about uh, the, the worker on the, on the floor typically didn't, you know, they had stress, right? But they weren't making the decision. They were just doing what they were told, right? And they were able to work and function and all that. So they had the, the least amount, right? They, they had the most work to do, but the less stress because they weren't making all the decisions. Then you talk about those who were high up on the corporate ladder, Right? Those who made all the decisions, they had stress, but in here, they were told other people what to do. Right? So they had healthier hearts. The people who were sort of in that middle place. Right? Those that were responsible for everyone underneath them, but yet were being told from above what to do, and they're being squeezed on both ends. Right? Have you ever felt yourself in that position where you're kind of in the middle? Right? You got pressure down below, you got pressure up above. And that's the kind of pressure that, that eats at you. Because in the end of it, you don't have the power to change things. And I know in my life, sometimes I find myself in a position where I feel stuck. You ever felt stuck? There's no exit ramp. Right? You, you kind of pray, Lord, I, I want to get off this ride. This ain't fun no more. But you have no power to change it. Yeshiva had no power in all this. You know? It wasn't her choice to have her husband go off to war. It wasn't her choice to be home alone. It wasn't her choice when the king called for her to go. It's interesting, in Romans chapter 8, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for, as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groans which cannot be uttered. 
when we are helpless. Sometimes we don't even know how to pray. You ever been in that? Lord, do you want me to go? Do you want me to stay? I, I don't know. I, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. Right? Over the years, I, I've struggled. You know, go to the hospital and visit someone and, and they're dying. Do you pray that God heals them? Or do you pray that God takes them home? I remember when I was just a young pastor, I was called in by a family and we gathered around and grandma was, was not doing well. She was in a lot of pain and they kept trying to up the meds to try to do that and, um, and she was dying. And this is the first time I found myself as a pastor in that circumstances. And, and the daughter looked at me and said, Pastor, is it okay to pray that she dies? Because I've always wanted, you know, let's pray they get better. But in this case, would it be better for how long? To find better, right? She knew the Lord. Her desire was to go home. To go see her husband and her Lord. And so... I told him to close the door. <laughs> and we prayed, Lord, she's tired. She loves you and she wants to go home. Is that the right prayer? I'm thankful at the end of it, I can say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Right? Lord, I, I want what you want. So I said amen and went home. I got a phone call from the family just a few hours later. They said that she went home to be with the Lord. She goes, thank you for praying. But sometimes we don't know how to pray. Right? We don't know the answer. I don't want to pray for the wrong thing. I'm thankful that God helps us in our weakness, that when we pray, the Holy Spirit will interpret that prayer for us. And Lord, I want this. And the Holy Spirit says, nah, no, he doesn't. <laughs> you know, he doesn't know what he's asking about. I'm thankful he does that for us. He helps us in our weakness. The psalmist says this, for he will deliver the needy when he cries, and the poor also, and him who has no helper. When we are alone, we are in a position of being powerless. God's our helper. And I trust in him. What a blessing that is. That God knows our helplessness. Second thing I want to look at is that God knows our tears. Because as we shared, David came out and saw her and she was bathing and he said, wow, who is that? That's Uri Uriah, that's the soldier that's been faithful to you for all these years. That's his wife. And he goes, get her for me. And she comes up and David sleeps with her and she discovers that she's pregnant. And David plots a scheme. What he does, he sends for Uriah to come. He says, look, have him come home from the field. And he hasn't seen his wife for a while. He'll come home and, and go see her. And When the word gets out that she's pregnant, they'll think it's Uriah when Uriah came home. And David has this whole plan. Right? Nowhere does it ask Bathsheba what she wants to do. Right? She says, how do you stand up against the king? It's easy for us to get judgmental, right? Sometimes we get judgy on people's lives when they feel like they have no way out. And sometimes they make poor decisions, but they are powerless in those circumstances. Be careful of doing that. 
So David calls for Uriah, and he comes home, and he's like, David, my fellow soldiers are out in the field. They can't come home. It's not right for me to go in to my wife. And so he goes, and he sleeps in the door. Doesn't go in. And David's like, oh, no, my plan's not going to work. So he gets a few drinks in him, and he figures, okay, if I get him drunk enough, he'll go home. And Uriah goes and lays down at the doorstep, refuses to go in. So David panics and he goes, what can I do? So he writes a note to the captain on the battlefield. It says, look, I want you to take Uriah and go and storm the troops, storm the enemies, go up to the front lines, put Uriah right up front. And when you get everyone up there, you're fighting the battle, you're all on the front line, Uriah's right up front, I want you to all pull back and leave Uriah by himself. So in the heat in the battle, the army steps back and Uriah gets killed on the battlefield. Second Samuel chapter 11 picks this up. When the wife of Uriah heard that her, Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Bathsheba was, was helpless in this situation. It's interesting, you say, oh, it's easy for her to say, oh, she should have stood up against the king. She had no authority to say no. What would he do, right? Here, David showed that he'd be willing to kill the husband to protect his own. Imagine Bathsheba was afraid. And here she is, she's mourning. But who could she tell? Who could she pour her heart out to? Who would believe her? And she wept. You know, sometimes in our grief, we find ourselves all alone. But the Lord knows your helplessness. The psalmist says, He heals the brokenhearted, He binds up their wounds. I was blessed are those who mourn. As we come to the Lord and pour out our heart, He helps us. He hears us. Maybe your life has been filled with tears. And sometimes those tears are because of our grief. That Bathsheba here lost a husband. All because of the whims of David. And maybe your life has been by the tragedies and you just come before the Lord with tears in your eyes. I don't know if you ever cried at night. You know? The rustle and bustle of the day slows down. Do you find yourself alone? I remember years ago talking to my mom. After my stepfather passed away, and my mom a, uh, is a strong woman, pretty independent. And I asked her how she was doing, and she goes, I do pretty good until the night comes. She goes, I can keep myself busy, but sooner or later, I'm always home alone. And she goes, all I can do is call out to God. Matthew tells us, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be what? Comforted. In our helplessness, the Lord comforts us. He comes near to us. He understands grief. Sometimes our tears are because of our loneliness. You know, I used to think that loneliness was an issue when you had no one around. But that's only a part of loneliness. You know, the older I get, the more I realize probably the most lonely you can be is when you're around everyone else. And you feel alone. 
You know, people ask how you're doing, and you're like, I'm fine. You know what? And you're really not fine. Right? When you're going wrong, and, and you'll feel like anyone would understand. I, I, I think of Christmas, and so many people are, are rejoicing and, and being happy and putting up lights, but so many people are hurting and struggling this time of year. And this Put on a brave face and plug through it. I'm thankful that we have a God who says He will never leave us nor forsake us. That you're never alone. The Lord is ever present to hear you and answer you. Sometimes we shed tears because of uncertainties in our life. You know, sometimes we just don't know. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We, we don't know how the surgery is going to go. We, we don't know how the finances are going to work out. There's so many things that we just do not know. And they become so overwhelming on us. The Lord knows our tears. Look, Psalms, and I love this. It says, You number my wanderings, and you put my tears in your bottles. Are they not in your book? I love this imagery. Every tear you have shed, the Lord knows. I hope we find comfort in that. There will be a day when everything will be made right. I am thankful that things and the sorrows of this world are only temporary. Amen? And they seem so long. Trust me, I understand. What you're going through might seem as, oh, it's been going on forever. It's been chronic. It's never ceasing. Yet, let me tell you, compared to eternity, what we're going through now will be just a drop in the bucket. Look for a better day. See, God knows our plights. You are not going through this alone. Bathsheba seemed like it was helpless, right? The king was going to get away with it. Actually, imagine this. Imagine being Bathsheba. Here she is pregnant. Her husband has just been killed. Right? So she mourns, and after the customary mourning period is done, David says, oh, Bathsheba, come here. Why don't you become my wife? The one who killed your husband. Not only that, but see, everyone knew Uriah came home. Right? Most people would presume that he went into his wife. And here she is pregnant. And David is the hero of the story who now takes this widow and brings him in and says, I'll take care of her. Do you see how diabolical that is? And what can she say? And it seems like David is getting away with it. And I think sometimes in our lives, when you look at those around us, it seems like evil wins, doesn't it? It seems like evil gets away with it sometimes. It seems like those who are against us, they seem to prosper. How come, Lord? Let me tell you something. That is temporary. The Lord knows your plight. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, right, one chapter over, it says that the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, a rich and the other poor. And he talks about the rich man. And he took the poor man's lamb and paired it for the man who had come to him. He tells a story of the rich man who had many sheep, who had many things, and the poor man who only had one little lamb. Actually, he loved this little lamb so much, he slept with it, he cared for it. He was like a child to him. And the rich man took the poor man's lamb and killed it. Now David was a shepherd before this. The Bible says that David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he had done this thing, and because he had no pity. David was outraged. How dare someone do something like this? And Nathan says, you are that man. 
You had the whole kingdom. And you reached down into this one family and in your greed took all that they had. You're this man. And it's interesting because David's sin was exposed. There will be a time when things will be set right. I believe that with all my heart. That the injustice that you and I go through, God will set that right. The book of Exodus, as Egypt was suffering in, uh, with uh, Egypt, the Lord says, Surely I have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and heard their cries because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Oh, Lord knows. Book of Revelation, chapter 6. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge your blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were were completed. How long till justice is served? The Lord says, just wait a little longer. Those are against you. If you are in the right, someday we'll face the Lord. Give it to the Lord's hands. Romans tells us, Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. It's not your job to get even. God will do that. At the end of the book, it says, It's all the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the Lamb's Book of Life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the book. They will stand before God and have to give an account for it all. Christian, hang on a little longer. We look at Bathsheba, who was caught up in all these circumstances, and yet God knew. God cared. And God will set right. Brothers and sisters, hang on. And we see this in Matthew, that, that Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon by her, who had been the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. That in here, Solomon was born, who became king. Who through this, the Messiah was born. God's not done with your story. God wasn't done with Bathsheba's story. Trust in him. Be grafted into his grace. Hang on just a little longer. The Lord is faithful to those who are faithful to him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you as you look at Bathsheba. Lord, she was she was helpless. And Lord, you saw her tears. Lord, you knew her plight. And Lord, you set things right. Lord, in our life, Lord, I pray for those who are struggling. And maybe they feel like they're alone, Lord. They're not. Lord, you are by their side. Lord, just give them strength to hang on just a little longer. Let them know they're not alone. We ask this in your name. Amen.